Um, we're going to talk about wintering. And uh, if you're, depending on where you're located in the world, um, it is certainly a possibility that you've experienced wintering or, or winter anyway. Um, my uh, uh, wife's family is from Oklahoma City or Yukon, actually, if you know where Express Rail, mile south of that. But anyway, they're, um, they got not only um, winter, but they got a tornado. So that's not so awesome. Uh, so we're going to make some assumptions, or I'm not going to make, I'm going to make some assumptions. And we're going to go ahead and uh, do this. We're going to assume that you've either calved in the spring or in the fall. For those of you that are crazy enough to calve in the wintertime, um, we will um, respond to that based on your questions um, when you ask them in the chat. So, uh, so cold winter impacts cattle, um, not the same way that um, it impacts us. Uh, you have to understand that um, uh, a good friend of mine's um, uncle is a veterinarian and he says that he's famous for saying um, the woolly mammoth didn't survive last ice age, but Boss Taurus did. And so uh, I'm a big fan of outwintering. Um, that doesn't mean you just turn them out and forget them. Uh, but I do believe that cattle are made to live outside. Barns are made for people. And uh, there is a time for, for barns, but um, they're not quite as uh, routinely needed as people might think. The other thing you have to make sure you remember is that um, the cow is a ruminant. And so she has a furnace. Um, she can actually um, generate a lot of heat when she's got a full uh, gut and she's in good uh, health. So remember that as well. Um, the, the, these animals were designed to live outside. Um, so we're gonna talk about this, as I said, um, fall calving cycle, that makes a big difference um, as to how we're gonna handle the females. Uh, we'll talk about replacement heifers and bulls as well, but we're going to talk about females first. Or, um, and that's going to be um, an important consideration uh, for, for um, your feeding strategies or wintering strategies as you go through the, the year. Fall calving cows are obviously going to have a higher plane of nutrition than spring calving cows because those cows are dry. And winter calving cows are going to have a higher plane of need because they're in the beginning of their lactation. Um, and there's a higher demand on the front end of that lactation. You remember that the highest, the lactation curve starts at birth and goes, you know, precipitously up until you get out at about after about. 90 days to flatten off and then it'll go down. So remember those nutritional needs as you're thinking about your animals um, when, you're, when you're feeding them. So first thing you should do is focus on um, body condition score. And actually we're a little late for that. Um, I'm gonna tell you to do it now anyway, but uh, we really needed to be doing, looking at that in the fall around the October time. And we had still had time to put some uh, flesh on cattle if we needed to, uh, but you should be monitoring your body condition score um, the whole time. Uh, in my opinion, the whole cycle of life every every month. I mean, if you're like me, um, I'm with the cattle at least once a day, every day, and sometimes during calving, I'm in there multiple times. Um, and you need to be looking at uh, some things. We, my partner and I were talking today we got a heifer, a, a heifer that was weaned back in October, and she's continuing to go go downhill. We we kind of suspect she has hardware, so, but that's something that we see every day. We notice that she's changing, and um, we need to make some adjustments. And we're not going to make adjustments um, from a nutritional standpoint on that heifer. She's actually going to get a ride to Hagerstown, but um, there are some reasons to to make some nutritional um, decisions. Some folks like to uh, divide their herds up. So if you've got two-year-olds or first calf heifers, um, you might want to keep them in one 
herd and you, you're running age cows, that's three three years and over or four years and over, you're going to look at um, managing them differently. Uh, they're, they're done growing. They're just uh, going to be putting flesh on and so on. So again, they're, it's, it's up to you how you manage your herd. But if you can look at those cattle a little bit differently, it will help you um, in the long run when you're feeding. Um, so having a good body condition where, as I said, going into winter does two things. First, uh, a cow in good body condition um, has a, a layer of insulation or fat to help her conserve body heat. And in good body condition, she's less likely um, when, or she's not going to need to be putting on fat. So when she's eating, she's going to be able to generate heat um, as well as, as just uh, taking in nutrition. And lastly, she's going to have a nice, um, hopefully, depending on where you are in the world, she's going to have a nice warm winter hair coat. Um, so we've talked about body condition scoring um, many, many times, and we're not going to go into it at length today. But basically, we're looking at that five to six. Um, you know, four is a borderline. So again, if, if I have a, a winter or a fall calving uh, cow, that's a four, I'm gonna be less harsh on her than I am if I have a, a, a four body condition score that's a spring calving cow. And when I say harsh, I just mean my assessment of her and what I'm gonna to have to do to make changes. Um, certainly with a, a lactating cow, I'm, I'm hopefully already addressing that and I'm expecting her to be a little bit lighter because she's uh, milking, but we're gonna, uh, again, address that. Again, it's a one through nine scale one being severely emaciated and nine being fat, like obese fat. Um, again, when you're selling white meat cows, a seven, eight's not bad um, when you're sending her to market for hamburger, but you certainly don't want to be carrying those things around uh, the farm. They're going to add problems when it comes to calving, when it comes to metabolic problems, when they're, calve, uh, when they're lactating and so on. So we really want the sweet spot, you know, that five, five and a half, I'm not going to fuss you too bad if it's a six, um, but we certainly want those animals to be in good shape, especially going into the winter. And, and that's going to be an important time. Um, like I said, we probably should have had this webinar in October uh, to set you up. But now uh, tomorrow you go out and look at your herd and you can start saying, where am I and what do I need to do? Uh, and we'll talk about some cautions as we get through this as well to be careful. Um, so one thing for sure, especially if you're, if you're winter calving or if you're fall calving, it's a great idea to know what your forage resources are. And when I talk about that, mainly I'm talking about your hay. Uh, you're going, again, if you stockpiled fescue, if you've got some stockpiled grasses, those are probably going to be really good when it comes to protein and you're going to have to watch your energy supplementation. But if you're going to feed hay as the main part of the diet or the entire diet, then you really need to know what you're feeding because all hay is not created equal. And again, if those are fall calving cows or lactating, or if you're going to start calving in January, you really need to be feeding those animals a higher quality forage than I'm going to feed a dry cow that's going to calve in, in March or April. Uh, her needs are going to be very, very different. And then inventory your forage based on quality. So know where that hay is that you can feed to those fall, spring calving cows or, or those, that hay that you can feed to a lesser um, nutrient demanding animal than you're gonna be doing when it comes to those um, animals that are higher in their nutrient needs. As I've already talked about, you can sort your cow herd in nutritional groups, um, thin cows or young cows. Again, match the forage, as I said. Determine your supplemental needs to balance the diet to minimize costs. Again, most of this should have already been done by this time. Um, it's eat, it, because that way you could have bought your any of your supplements during harvest when it's typically going to be cheaper than it's going to be if you try to buy them at the end of February. Um, I can't stress enough body condition score. And then remember supplemental energy for thin cows or for cows under cold stress. Again, not just because you're uncomfortable outside doesn't mean a cow's under cold stress. And we'll, we'll, deal, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. 
So when you're wintering cattle, you need to think about site conditions. Number one, uh, in my opinion, enemy of cow comfort in the wintertime outside is mud. Um, you need to make sure those animals are dry. They need to be get, have areas of upland. You know, a lot of people think, oh, if I put them in a hollow, that, that's a good windbreak. Well, that could be true from the wind perspective, but if it's a mud hole, it's a disaster. Um, the other thing I want rem to remember is that there has to be water available. Um, we talked about windbreak and then south facing slopes. So number one, water available. Ice does not equal water, okay? We need water. Um, I recommend any type of frost-free, and they'll always say frost-free. They are not freeze-proof uh, unless you've got electric. So if you're using geothermal um, aid from the, the soil, when you, you know, you got a pipe that goes down five or six feet, uh, that's going to be frost free, but it's not going to be freeze proof. Uh, so you still got to remember that you're going to have to have enough animals on that water to keep water flowing and those kind of things. You need to check it. Um, I check my water depending on the how cold it is at least once a day, usually in the morning because we've gone through the coldest part of the night, but also I will check it in the afternoon. If you have what I call the monuments, the NRCS, um, those big round concrete uh, waters that don't flow through anymore because the spring has changed or whatever, and they're now on pressure, um, you probably should do what I do and I carry a hatchet. And every morning I chop ice, and sometimes every evening I chop ice, depending on what the temperature is. The other thing to remember, cows that are lactating, require more water than cattle that are not lactating. So those dry cows, those spring calving cows that don't um, have a calf on them are not as, um, I'm not saying they don't need water. I'm just saying they don't need as much water uh, as well as those lactating cows are gonna need a lot more water. Depending on what they're eating, if they're eating dry hay and they're gonna need more water. If they're, if they're eating, Stockpiled fat fescue, they're going to get some moisture out of their forage. So again, just make sure you monitor those types of situations. Wind breaks. Again, wind is the enemy. Um, it's not a, um, you know, a, a thing that you can't manage, but thing you need to think about. Um, I've got some examples of wind breaks here. I've got a planted wind break. Uh, sometimes, if you're if you ever get out west, they call them sometimes shelter belts. Uh, but we're talking about a, a tree line. Um, we're lucky enough on some of our areas to, in, in Washington County anyway, that we have the Eastern Red Cedar and, and they make a nice windbreak, a nice place to winter animals. Uh, you can see you can do it with bales um, and you can do it with um, uh, man-made uh, structures there with, made out of uh, tin and steel. You need to remember with those types of things that depending on where you live, uh, that you're not building a kite, but you're building a structure that's a wind break. Um, so you may need to anchor them to the ground or they may need to have sufficient weight to stay where you put them. Um, in deference to my friends that love the calve in the wintertime for some unknown reason, I put two pictures in there that you can see. Uh, those calves that once they're dry and mama has started to take care of them and they got a good belly full of colostrum, they can take the winter. Again, not my favorite time of year to calve, I don't think we should put calves in those positions, but again, everybody's got their own uh, schedules. Everybody's got their own markets and they need to time their calving according to their markets. So um, I'm not gonna fuss you too much, um, but you can expect that I'm gonna ask you why. Feeding, uh, feeding comes in all different shapes and sizes. Some people put hay wagons out. Some people put hay rings out. Uh, the picture you see here is what we call bale grazing. Um, you can see that there's bales set up throughout the field, and then there's um, electric polywire, electrified polywire that's, that's blocking um, the areas to, to limit the cattle's access to those bales, and then the polywire is dropped as we move through the 
well, I should say the netting is cut off first. Please cut the netting and twine off your, your bales. Uh, don't think that um, Bossy can take care of that. And then we end up, I've seen cattle, I, actually I've watched cattle eat twine. Um, I don't like that. I don't like the idea of having to come through there later in, in time and pulling bale strings out of the dirt and everything else. So please take the net wrap or the strings off first and then go ahead and feed your animals. There's been a lot of work with bale grazing done in Canada because the ground's frozen all the time. One thing we have to remember here in Maryland is mud. And so strategically place your bales where you want to renovate a pasture in some way, shape or form. Um, I'm not trying to read into this picture too much because it's a friend of mine, but I've heard that bale grazing can help you um, with suppression and uh, I hate to use the word eradication, but I'm going to anyway, um, broom sedge. And that's that rusty grass you see out there. Uh, broom sedge is typically a symptom of either low phosphorus and or low pH. And so by feeding those bales and concentrating that manure, hopefully we're gonna increase our phosphorus in, the, in that area and we're gonna be able to battle that broom sedge. Uh, but again, we're gonna be very strategic where we're gonna um, allow those cattle to go in. We're gonna put them upslope if it's real muddy. We're not gonna put them in a mud hole. Remember, mud is an enemy because we that, that, that mats down hair. And remember what we're doing when we're warming cattle is we're trapping air between hair, okay? And that's our insulation, that warm air pocket. Um, a cow's feed intake will, can increase by as much as 20% during cold weather. So keep that in mind. If we're feeding, you know, and you're feeding typically throughout the winter, you might want to, you're going to need to increase either your frequency of feeding. So instead of putting a bale in every other day, maybe it's every day, or maybe I'm going to put two day, two bales in a day instead of one. You need to think about um, how you're going to manage that. Um, because remember, again, in, in addition to forage and nutrition, we're also feeding that furnace, uh, that rumen, that fermentation vat that she's helping to generate um, energy or heat, I'm sorry, to keep herself warm. In the process, it, it, it helps, keeps the cows warm from the inside out if you wanna think of it in that way. So don't forget about the bulls. A lot of times, you know, especially folks that aren't breeding. So we, we're winter calving or we pulled the bulls out of our fall cows or we're spring calvers. So the bulls have been in the bull lot for how long? Um, think about it, are they resting? So if we're, if we're a fall calving herd, maybe they're working. Maybe we got bulls in the field right now, um, fall calving cows. Certainly for our calving window, we do. Um, are they resting? Are they growing? Remember, if you're if you're growing your own bulls, if you're raising your own herd sires and they're calves, they started out as calves and you weaned them this fall and they're going through the winter, you want to make sure they're gaining at least a pound and a half a day. We can get we'll get compensatory gain in the spring when we get on grass and everything else, but we need to have those animals continuing to grow a bit during the winter. And when 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 it happens, remember we've got cold stress or potentially not every day. Um, remember, a, a day that's 35 degrees is not cold to a cow or a bull or a heifer. Um, but we need to remember we're, they're growing. We need to remember they've got maintenance. And we need to remember they may need some extra energy to, to heat themselves or increase their, their heating uh, if it gets too cold. So again, those are all things that have to be taken into consideration. That would be the same with heifers. A lot of times heifers get a little more attention. Um, probably because they're closer to home. We got a group, maybe we've been feeding them anyway since we weaned them. Um, but don't forget about heifers either. Don't be, don't be the guy that kicks heifers out into the back pasture and doesn't think about them until the next spring. Um, they have to be cared for as well. And similarly um, to what, what I was talking about with the bull calves. Uh, remember those young animals are still growing. So we're trying to you know, fend off um, a slow growth pattern, as well as um, trying to make sure that they're still 
no cold stress and and they're ma they're maintaining their body uh, heat as well or so I always call the breeding bull the forgotten man. Um, you know, everybody pays attention to him when he's running with the cows. And then when he's not, um, for a lot, especially small herds, Maryland has a lot of small herds. And most of the time, people look at this guy as a pain in the rear end. Um, because what do you do with him when he's not running with the cows? And, and anybody that's ever heard me talk before knows that I'm a huge proponent of having a calving season. And a calving season does not extend 365 days to me a calving season ought to be 45 days my that's my ultimate goal um, we actually made our spring calving herd this year our, our ultimate outcome of our spring calving herd was we calved our cows out in 50 days um, 60 days is my upper limit um, i'd love to get to 45 days we preg checked it looks like we might be pretty darn close this spring um, but, but, you know, the proof's in the pudding when the calf hit the ground, so we'll find out. But this guy often gets maligned. He's, you know, when he's running with the cows, we think about him when we pulled him out, you know. So, again, look at his body condition score. Watch his, his feet and leg sounds because he's going to be out there probably again, put somewhere where he doesn't tension, you know, hard, hard ground, frozen ground. Stones that have come up, heaved up out of the ground because of freezing and thawing, bruised feet, those kind of things all can happen. And we need to pay attention to this guy because we don't want to come up next March or April get thinking about, okay, we're going to put the bull in here in a couple of weeks and he's not going to be sound. We need to think about the plane of nutrition for him too. Hopefully he came out of the breeding season at about a five. Um, if he didn't, I hope you put some weight on him before you throw him out and in, in to fend for himself. Uh, but again, we're going to look, we're going to monitor that for him. Uh, here's a guy that you can stick a bale of hay in and just let him have it for the, for until he cleans it up or if you got a couple bulls. Um, also, we need to guard against frostbite. Here's where that mud comes in again. If he's laying in the mud, his testicles are, la are laying on mud. And we can have, when frostbite occurs, we can have some serious issues when it comes to fertility. And the last thing you want to do is to put a bull out with your cows and he not functioning properly. And you come up with a lot of open cows or maybe all open cows. So remember this guy, he's, as I said, I call him the forgotten man in a lot of cases um, because, you know, we're, we're done with him. He's out there. He's not causing us any real issues, but it, we're not, we don't really pay too much attention to him. So you need to really remember that. When it comes to supplemental feeding for any of these class of animals, you know, we're always going to look at least cost because the number one cost that we have in the beef business is feed. Second is labor and third is cow depreciation. And so cow depreciation is those cows that get sold because they're open. So remember, bully boy here, if he has frostbitten testicles or scrotum, um, he may be causing you cow depreciation because you've got open cows that you've got to sell. So keep that in mind as well. But we're going to look at supplementing that hay. Since we've had a forage test, now we need to know, you know, what where was the TDN? You know, is the TDN below 64? You might want to think about energy supplementation. Look at the uh, the protein. Quite frankly, if that protein is somewhere between 10 and 12, um, it's completely adequate, especially if you're, you've got these animals out on pasture, where I can tell you that you're, especially if you're in my country and you've got stockpiled fescue, that fescue's got plenty of protein in it. Um, it's probably going to be a little deficient on, on some energy, uh, but, you know, we can supplement that energy with distillers or corn, uh, a lot of other energy type feeds we can utilize. Again, we're going to try to buy the cheapest um, feed we can. Uh, because that's going to be kind of important for us. Uh, we really want to make sure that we're trying to keep our feed costs down. Uh, I don't want to cheat us, but I, I want you to think about getting the most economical feed. Um, I have this talk a lot with folks that have small operations and they're buying their feed by the bag, which I certainly appreciate because not everybody has, you know, a four ton gra uh, grain bin sitting out uh, next to their shed. 
but don't get sucked into some of the stuff. Somebody will tell them, oh, you need to feed this feed or that feed. Quite frankly, fancy feed doesn't do anything but have fancy bags. Um, think about it, you need somewhere around 12% protein, 64 TDN, and you're good to go. Um, and again, if we're supplementing with forage, uh, even some of the poor grass hays, we're gonna be fine. Uh, and we don't have to feed a lot of expensive feed. Like I said, there's nothing really new in, in caring for bulls during winter. It's just good animal husbandry. You know, look at the guy every now and then. Um, so they'll be successful in the next, um, the coming breeding season. Most people don't think about it this way, but that guy right there, especially, like I said, in Maryland, where we have small herds, lots of people only have one bull. He's 50% of your genetics. That's 50% of your, your cow herd genetics is standing right there. And if he's not well taken care of, you're going to, one, be scrambling for, to find a replacement for him next spring, or worse, not be able to find a replacement for him next spring. So again, think about that. Um, that's half your genetics. And it's certainly important to remember um, that, that he's out there and, and he's not the forgotten man. So in summary, real quick, we're gonna just talk about it. If you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Um, again, uh, plan to succeed, don't fail to plan. And you can't manage what you don't measure. And I didn't talk a lot about measuring, um, looking at your pasture, but you should have an inventory of your pasture as well as your uh, hay. Everybody can count bales, but walk your pastures. Where am I gonna put these animals? Where do I have pasture left? Have I made strategic plans in, in stockpiling certain areas of my field, my farm to winter graze? Um, a lot of folks in fescue country, which we live in, at least here in Western Maryland, um, we specifically set aside some acreage that we haven't maybe been on since August that we're gonna turn cattle on around Christmas or New Year's and they're gonna winter on that stockpiled fescue. Again, we're talking about open animals if we're putting lactating females on that um, stockpiled fescue, we're probably going to have to supplement um, in most cases. Um, and so we're going to think about that as well. But are we going to put it, have, a, have an inventory? Um, where are you going to calve? If you're a March or April calver um, going into January, what are, your, what are your calving fields look like? Have you set them up for success? Are they going to be the first ones to green up? Um, you know, have you, do you have things set that in that direction? Uh, if you're going to need to feed during the early calving season, uh, where is that going to be? Am I ready to do that? You know, so think about all those things um, as you always be. I try to think be thinking um, about a season ahead. So I already know where my cows are going to calve in the spring. I know what the forage is like in those, those fields. Um, I know where I'm going to feed winter hay. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about um, was rolling hay out. Um, some folks uh, have bale on rollers and, and, I, and I think that's a great thing. Um, but for me, we, we use um, slope and gravity. So we cut the bales and roll them down the hill. And that's the lazy man's way to do it, maybe, or the poor man's way of doing it. But we certainly um, enjoy doing that kind of thing when it comes to feeding hay that way. I look at places where I know the soil's thin or poor and do it that way. I try only to roll out enough hay to be cleaned up in a day and a half uh, at most because I don't want cows making a muddy mess. I don't want them tearing things up. And so I'll adjust that again, too. If I know it's really wet. I'm going to move those bales. Again, I'm going to make sure they're on a slope where it's not going to be um, a mess. I don't want that bale on the bottom of the field and so on. Um, so evaluate whether your cows are ready for going into winter. Like I said, I'm, I'm, I apologize, but it's probably a little late for that now. You're going to be playing catch up all winter. Um, evaluate your feed resources and make needed adjustments when uh, the as the time comes. So with 
that said, we're, I'm going to open it up for questions here in just a second. I'm going to stop sharing.